Stuart Bloor and welcome to episode 4. This is a very specific video, Barbel River Severn Flood Water. Anyway, before we get down to the water's edge, we had a very special visitor in the local area recently. I was able to film it, although I was at a distance, so the film is a little bit shaky at times. I'm sure you can make it out. Here it is. I'm on the middle seven in Shropshire. The river is 12 feet up and rising. So right at the start of this video, as far as bankside activity is concerned, I want to say that if you are thinking of fishing in these conditions, then you need to tick the box of safety. The banks are very wet, very slippery, muddy. Where you fish is so important. Therefore, you need to know the swim already because it's a dangerous out there. The last thing I want to do is end up in that river. But also, secondly, from a very practical point of view, with that much water on the river, things like small bushes, vegetation, that sort of thing, are now covered up. The last thing you want to be doing is casting into them and losing tackle and, of course, fish. So, don't be deterred by rivers that are in this sort of condition. What you need to do is you need to do your homework, first of all. We're now into dusk and I'm watching the rods. It hasn't stopped raining all afternoon. It's quite a murky, overcast, miserable sort of day. I'm often asked by anglers, can you give me a tip? Well, the greatest tip I could ever give anyone is go fishing. I'm the only angler on this stretch. I've got the whole place to myself. There's about five or six fields. I'm the only one here. And do you know what that means? I'm the only one that's got a chance of catching something from here today. Good question there from Paul. Certainly as far as floodwater barbel fishing is concerned, that's not really for beginners. What I would say to folks is find a river, find a stretch of river that contains lots of barbel. For example, if you live in my area or within reasonable different distance, the middle seven is perfect. It's known as Barbel Alley. Now I'm not saying that they're queuing up to be caught, but what I am saying is they're easier, inverted commas, to catch than perhaps going on the River Sow, where I've fished a few times over the years and they really are as rare as hen's teeth. So you choose a stretch of river where the barbel are more numerous and then go when the conditions are quite favourable. So summer barbel fishing, that's a great time. The fish will be hungry, they'll be active, you'll be able to fish spot as you walk the banks. All of those things will work in your favour. As for the tactics themselves, well, it's, it's usually ledger in. I know some anglers float fish for barbel and that's a great way of catching them, but pretty much most of us, we tend to go ledgering for barbel, don't we? So once you start to go beyond that, well, we haven't got time to cover everything, but my tip would be, if you've never targeted barbel before, certainly don't start when the river's 12, 15 foot up and racing through. Choose a time of the year when the conditions are favourable. Get to a place where you know there are plenty of barbel to be caught. Cut your teeth on that sort of river, on those sort of venues, and then as you begin to progress, maybe the flood water and all the challenges that come with it, that's when you can tackle the sort of conditions that we've seen in the video so far. You may be watching this video and thinking, I'd love to fish the River Severn. You live outside the area, you've never been here before, 
and you're thinking to yourself, I'd love to give it a go. Well, you can. There's a club in particular that I would recommend, Kimber Freeliners, and a stretch called Hampton Load, which is quite famous. It's featured on TV angling programs before and is well known in the fishing world. And Kimber control 50 pegs of that prime barbel spot on the middle seven. It's not far from the main bridge north to Kidderminster Road. Access is good. There's a good car park. It's safe and the river begins at the car park. So for those who aren't perhaps as mobile as others, there's not too much traveling involved to get to the first few pegs. Although having said that, it's not armchair fishing. So you need to have a certain amount of mobility. And if you're going to get right the way down the stretch and explore all of the swims, then you really do need to perhaps be a little bit more active. But if you tick all those boxes, it's a great place to try. Lots of barbel there, chub, dace, the whole lot, they're all in there. And it's very picturesque as well. With the Seven Valley Railway opposite, you'll see steam trains coming up and down all day long, especially during school holidays at Christmas and that time of the year. It's five pound on the bank as well. So all you need to do is park your car. You have to pay a pound for parking. There's a letterbox on the car park where you put your pound in, pay your money, get down there, then the bailiff will come and get your five pound off you. Fishing though for non-members is just dawn till dusk. Members can stay a little bit longer at certain times of the year and it's not worth chancing because it is well bailiffed. The bailiffs live on site as it were and the cars that are on the car park they'll recognise, they'll know which cars belong to members. It's not a big club, it's not thousands of people so they don't know who the cars are but if you do get down there it's definitely worth a go. So check out the Kimber website and of course you can ask questions, you can put questions to me if you like, I'm happy to answer them, but you can contact Kimber direct and also as well with the costings and all the details, check closer to the date because the information that I'm giving now could of course change in due course, but fancy a go on the River Severn, the Middle Severn, fancy tackling some of those barbel that the river, river is famous for, then definitely Hampton Load on the Kimber Freeliners ticket. Lovely pull around there, and I've got a barbel on. And hopefully I'm gonna land this. I know where the vegetation is beneath me, and I'm steering it away from the denser stuff. It's the important thing about fishing a flooded river. You need to know what's out there in front of you. Anyway, I think I'm in the, the final furlong can hear the splash there. Hopefully next time you'll see me on camera I'll have a nice barbel to show you. That's a nice enough fish eh? It was great to get that one on the bank. This is actually my third session. I haven't been here very long. The other two produced barbel blanks. I had some chub plucks and what I do when I'm barbel fishing is I tend to fish with a boilie and I'll tell you why in a moment but I keep a reasonably long hair, not a short one because the chub will pick the bait up and I'm not really bothered about catching lots of fish I want to set my stall out to catch that big barbel and the reason why I go with boilies is that I've found personally over the years that boilie tends to produce not so many fish 
as far as I'm concerned, but they are definitely better quality. And angling can be, for you, whatever you want it to be. For me, I most definitely prefer quality over quantity any day of the week. This is what I always do when I throw loose boilies out. Obviously on rivers it doesn't have the same edge as maybe on a still water, but I think it still gives you a tiny little bit of an extra percentage chance and that's what you're looking for sometimes. It's a very fine line between catching nothing and actually getting a decent fish on the bank. I'm fishing boilies, there's my dip. What I do is I put my finger in the dip like so. So I've got plenty of stuff all over me. Get my hand in the boilie bag and then rub it over the boilies so that they have a nice coating on them. Might not last very long in the river, but it's there for a certain amount of time, isn't it? And as always, angling is a confidence thing. If whatever you do gives you confidence, it will help you to fish better and it will put fish on the bank. As you saw just that fish went back safely. The important thing with barbel to remember is that they always give their all. Now of course all fish do but when you're pulling a two ounce roach at the canal which takes seconds as opposed to a decent barbel which will put up a tremendous fight the difference is the barbel will need lots of time to recover and we use the term belly up which indicates that a fish has been put back into the river far too early, it hasn't recovered, it floats downstream and eventually it dies. That's not what we want to do, that's not the sort of practice that we want to see on our rivers. So when you catch a barbel, make sure that you nurse it if possible, stay there with it in the landing net. Don't worry about catching more fish, the important thing is to give that one in the net full respect. Nurse it back and then and only then release it when you know that it will go back safely, as indeed that one did and all my other fish do as well. I read an article recently in a newspaper. It was about Annika Rice. Can you remember her? Wore the tracksuit, blonde hair, came out the helicopter, had a challenge. And that was the name of the programme, wasn't it? Challenge Annika. Well, for those of you who are perhaps a lot younger than me, you won't know who she was, but she was quite well-known TV personality some years ago. And in the article, she actually said that she had gone into a 17-year exile at the height of her fame. One day, she happened to read an article herself, and it was about her, and the person that wrote it was very unkind, very cutting, in fact. And he said that I wished She'd fall from the helicopter and described her as worse than Myra Hindley. Now, for those who don't know the name Myra Hindley, she was, in no uh, uncertain terms, a monster, really. So this article was absolutely scathing against Annika Rice. And what it did is it caused her to withdraw. She actually went into herself and stepped away from public life for 17 years. And it got me thinking when I read the piece, it was an interview actually with Annika Rice, because two things stood out to me. First of all, watch our tongue. We never know the effect that we have on people when we speak unkind words. We've all done it, we've all said things, maybe in anger, maybe some people like to be sarcastic, they think it's clever, but you never know the effect that you can have upon people. For example, you could call a girl fat and that could plunge her into eating disorder. We could make all sorts of comments about people that could put them into various states of depression that could actually ruin their lives. So what came over to me first of all is watch your tongue. Secondly, I think we need to not be so sensitive. It's good to be sensitive to a point because it means we're compassionate, we have a, we have a heart, we're not cold and hard-hearted. But there can come a point when you can become so 
sensitive, super sensitive, that it actually affects your life. For example, you think, did I upset the person? Did I offend them? Did I say something that they didn't like? And you could stay awake all night worrying about whether you've hurt that person or not. So there is a line at which I feel it's good to be sensitive but not to go too far down that road where actually we become so super sensitive that we actually begin to have a, a negative effect or it has a negative effect upon our own lives. So that article, thought for this week, actually two thoughts. Number one, watch our tongue, be careful, choose our words carefully because the words that we speak, they can be a blessing, but they can also be a curse. Watch our tongue. And secondly, it's good to be sensitive, but not too super sensitive. Otherwise, it will have a detrimental effect upon our own lives. I'm back for a fourth and final visit on the 7 this week. And as always, while I talk, watching the rods down there, wasting no time whatsoever, get fish in, then I can do the filming. It's been a slow week for sure, but one of the advantages of finding out or knowing what other anglers are up to is that you can actually pitch yourself realistically. So you might come out on the River Severn as I've done, catch a couple of fish over a number of sessions and think to yourself, do you know what? That was awful, wasn't it? But other fishermen may actually be blanking left, right and centre so that a couple of barbel can actually be a result. And I would never compare myself to other anglers in terms of being a better fisherman because you've caught more or anything like that. I'm not interested in competition along those lines, but I do find it quite useful when you pick up from friends, from anglers on the internet, what sort of things they've been catching. And this week it seems to be generally a very difficult week so that anglers are reporting lots of blanks or maybe the occasional fish here and there. And so that helps you in your own angling, doesn't it? Because you could be thinking, do you know what? I've had a couple of fish, I've had a terrible week, when in fact you've actually had a great one. Anyway, I've got this fourth and final outing, as I've said, and I'd love to end it with a fish. I've had a little bit of a problem this afternoon. When the river's eye in this particular swim, hence all the comments I've made about choosing the right swim when the conditions are as they are. When the river's eye, I can fish into the water into the riverbed, no problems. When it's low, I can do the same. But I'm actually now at the point where certainly with the right hand rod, I've been connecting with all that vegetation. It's not, it's not dense down there, I know what's there, it's not dense. But unfortunately, I'm at, the, I'm at that level when I have been losing lead. So I've decided to fish with just the one rod. So I'm fishing the left hand rod downstream, no problem at all there, that's okay. But do you know what? It's better to fish with one rod in the right place than two that aren't. And as it got dark, I did indeed catch a barbel. Just the one fish. But that's the fine line, isn't it, between success and failure. I was over the moon walking back to the car. I'll tell you something. Once the sun set, it wasn't a warm day prior to that. But once the sun did disappear over the trees on the far side, it became very, very cold. I could breathe out and my breath was hanging in the air. It was a frosty night when I actually did get back to the car. I had to scrape the ice off it. Not the sort of conditions that many anglers would be out in, but as long as you're there, you're baiting in the water, you've got a chance. And again, I proved that, didn't I? But as the water temperatures are now falling, I will be chasing other species. So I'll be back next Saturday with another video. I hope you've enjoyed this one. If you have, why not share it? Facebook, Twitter, Google+, etc. If you do, I would really appreciate that. Yeah.